This episode of Body Banter contains discussion of anti-Semitism and war crimes committed in Nazi Germany, including non-consensual use of deceased bodies for medical illustration. You are listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Chagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to this episode of Body Banter. Uh, I'm Shekou Yedele and I come to you today from Kelowna in the traditional and and unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. And as usual, I have Claudia. Hi, everyone. My name's Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the ancestral traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations here in Vancouver. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today with you. And we have a fantastic guest, uh, collaborator and friend, Sabina Hildebrand from Boston. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm Sabina Hildebrand. I'm an anatomy educator and I have a research interest in the history and ethics of anatomy. I spend a lot of my weekends on Cape Cod, which is the land of the Wampanoag, and I'm very glad to live in that beautiful surrounding and to acknowledge that particular land and people. We're so happy to have you here. You have done seminal work around the ethics of human bodies and the history of anatomy. How did you get into that field? Uh, well, it really started with my biography, not being born very long after the end of Second World War and growing up in Germany, being raised in Germany by my family who lived during uh, the Nazi time. Uh, trying to understand what my my family's history was, the, my country's history, uh, what my school's history was. My my uh, my uh, elementary school was called the Geschwister Schollschule uh, after the siblings Scholl, medical students and a biology student who were in the resistance against Hitler. So there was always this history and this very dark uh, interest in the very dark history of my country. At the same time. I was interested in, in learning uh, medicine when I got to my studies. Um, and uh, anatomy was a stumbling block for me in many ways, for me and many of my fellow students, because we couldn't get over the fact that we were dealing with dead human beings. We weren't told much at the time about the provenance of these human beings whose bodies we were working on. But we uh, met in our free time very often to speak about uh, death and dying. And it was an important topic for us. And then I forgot all about that. <laughs> and then I uh, life happened. And on my third career, I became an anatomy educator. And this history found me again, this history of, um, of uh, Nazi Germany, uh, and my interest in the provenance of human bodies in anatomy. And that was about 20 years ago when I was recruited to the University of Michigan and to work there as an anatomy educator. So that's where it all started. That's a really deep origin story for, for a very um, clear academic and personal interest. Um, in your work, looking at the provenance of bodies, um, Maybe we can start with sort of the dark chapter of German history during the Nazi era. What happened there and what was unique about that time? I mean, before um, 1933, were there any willed body donation programs in Europe and in Germany? And what changed when the Nazis came to power? So willed body donation programs were truly functional in the sense that they provided enough bodies for anatomical dissection courses and anatomical education are really a thing of the second half of the 20th century worldwide. Uh, and Nazi Germany uh, started in 1933 and ended in 1945. So before that time in Germany as elsewhere, 
uh, sporadic body donations were known very often by anatomists themselves um, or educated citizens, but those were truly sporadic and uh, far and few between. And we not have these uh, individual stories from various uh, European countries, also from the US, uh, but the bodies came from uh, so-called unclaimed sources. Those were persons who died in public institutions and were not claimed from their families for a burial. And that's true for any country that had uh, functional educational programs in anatomy that included student dissection. And that starts in the 18th, 19th century in Europe, as well as in the UK. And that was in, in Germany, no different than in any of the other countries. Uh, so there were laws. Anatomists traditionally had always negotiated laws about anatomical body procurement with their governments because they needed to have legal access unless they wanted, you know, they ran a risk of being punished for their body procurements. Um, so there were laws, uh, and that was, again, in Germany, no different than elsewhere. Um, what changed under the Nazis was uh, specifically the access to bodies of the executed. That was legalized in most countries around the world, except for the countries that were in the UK and the Commonwealth, uh, where the use of bodies of the executed had been expressly forbidden from 1832 on uh, with a law. Um, uh, but elsewhere in the world, bodies of the ex uh, up to then, up to 1832, actually in the, uh, in the UK and the Commonwealth, as elsewhere in the world, those were actually the oldest laws on anatomical body procurement using bodies of executed persons. They were usually called executed criminals. And now these laws existed in Germany as elsewhere. Um, before 1933. But what happened under the Nazis is that the Nazis changed their legislation as to who all could receive capital punishment. So up to 1933 in, in, in democratic Germany, it was high treason and murder that led to capital punishment. So really just two uh, causes, that, uh, reasons for capital punishment. And then very often the 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 uh, the the verdicts were not uh, actually executed, but under the, under the Nazis now there were up to forty different reasons for capital punishment, uh, and those escalated from 1933 into the war years. So uh, people could get uh, receive a death sentence for listening to enemy radio, or listening to uh, to the BBC, or for uh, making bad jokes about Hitler. Um, or stealing uh, uh, stealing uh, clothes from uh, from bombing sites, stuff like that could lead to capital punishment. But of course, also high treason, and high treason was very widely defined, um, so that uh, you had an escalating uh, number of uh, of executions, specifically during the war years. And all of these bodies were available to the anatomical institutes. So for the first time in probably anatomical history ever, there were quote unquote enough bodies for anatomical education. And on top of that, that those that these were highly desired bodies by the anatomists because bodies of the executed were fresh and very often of young, healthy people. So that's really scary, right? So all of a sudden we have an increase in um in executed people uh, which are delivered to anatomy departments and the anatomy departments were very willing recipients. Was there no ethical discussion, at least among some anatomists? I mean, um, or do we have any records of that? Or were people just accepting of this because of the, the I guess, their scientific curiosity, which could now be satisfied? So that's a question that I asked myself, and I looked very closely at the few and far between anecdotal uh, documentations we have of this. We know that a few anatomists actually um, noted uh, that the bodies came from clearly victims of the Nazi regime. So uh, other than the executed, uh, there were also clear signs of, of, of uh, violence on bodies from persons who came out of prisoner of war camps, for example. 
Um, so uh, the, we have some anecdotal information on that, uh, including from students who uh, decades after the war wrote about their experiences uh, very late after the war. Um, uh, but we also have uh, really official letters from prominent anatomists, most uh, most uh, importantly Hermann Stieve, who saw it as duty to use this quote unquote valuable material to uh, find anatomical knowledge that could not otherwise be gained anywhere else in the world. Specifically for this anatomist from Berlin, Stieve, that meant. He felt like he was the only one in the whole wide world who could have access to the bodies of young executed women to have information about the, uh, the influence of stress on the, on the reproductive organs of these young women's bodies. That's um, very scary, uh, just as Claudia said, uh, because then it seems that one individual or several individuals now had almost divine power to over human bodies to choose as they liked and to experiment as they liked and very little resistance and very little pushback was happening. No, I mean, there was no pushback from the from the anatomists, because even after the war, they justified their behavior. And we do have documentation on that. They justified their their behavior by saying, "What well, that was legal. We received these bodies by law. That was the law of the time. Uh, they did not question uh, the, the justice behind this law, the criminality of the regime. Very few of them did so, right? Uh, and we have actually only one documented anatomist who stopped her career um, after having encountered the bodies of the victims, um, whom she actually recognized um, as a resistance fighter. Um, so, what was her name? Uh, Charlotte Pommer. Okay, she we did, should say her name loudly and we should remember yes, her for doing the right the thing. The only one among the 180 that I've looked at uh, that we have information on. She is the only one, Charlotte Palmer. She had just graduated from medical school and she was, she wanted to have a career in anatomy. She felt herself very suited to that job. She worked for Steve. She was with him in the dissection labs when he was looking at the bodies of some of these resistance fighters who had been executed in Berlin. And um, after that encounter, she gave up her career in anatomy and then be, she became, she, you know, she was recruited actually, she, well, she was bound by duty from, from the government. She was um, recruited into hospital service in Berlin. And there she helped also with the, uh, with the um, shelter of resistance fighters in the hospital systems. And she ended up imprisoned and she was only ultimately rescued by the end of the war. Wow. It's good that we can add a positive story uh, to it, to this dark chapter. It, it's, I always find it depressing thinking about this era, how an entire population um, kind of acquiesced to what was happening uh, with very few people speaking out courageously against it. Um, so it's, I think, important to remember those who had that courage at great personal cost and loss. What happened in German society, do you think, that led to this um, complete disregard for the human body in that way? I mean, in, in many ways, we, we all have a human body. We all sort of cherish our bodies. We cherish the bodies of others. Um, what happens to a society where all of a sudden you have a totalitarian uh, oppressive regime um, and you vilify large segments of the population and uh, you increase the number of executions, what happens to the understanding of, of what a body is at that point? Oh, that is such a fascinating question that you're asking here, um, because I'm not sure that the understanding of the human body per se changed. 
uh, it was the uh, uh, it, it, it was the categorization, I think, of uh, who had a worthy body and who had an unworthy body. Um, and that ultimately goes back to eugenic thinking, which is in the in the German context, uh, race hygiene. Um, and that was actually a, a science that was strongly proposed, uh, uh, of which the anatomists as physical anthropologists were strong proponents. Um, there were, uh, among the anatomists, there were many who actually taught race hygiene uh, and who, uh, for that very reason, uh, supported uh, the Nazi party already in, in, the, in the 1920s because they believed that the Nazi party would be the one that would help them um, introduce uh, eugenic legislation uh, eugenic legislation, which, by the way, in the United States at that time had already been introduced in certain states uh, for 20 years, uh, right? Um, so in many ways, they took the legislation uh, in the United States as an example of what they wanted to do. And that had started, and that's not, that's actually not uh, unique to the Nazis. So there were also, of course, there were socialists who also uh, had very strong eugenic ideas, but the, the, the exaggeration then happened under the Nazis, right? And especially the thrust towards exclusion of certain parts of the uh, German population that were not considered worthy for eugenic reasons, uh, eugenic and true racist reasons, actually. Those are not always overlapping. And, and, and so, I mean, I'm looking at the pattern where some people, like eugenics brings up all kinds of horror, horror stories. Some people believe they're better than others. They have a pure race and others are tainted or dirty and so on. And I'm just trying to update our, our discussion and, and kind of fast forward to, to present, present day. Um, that kind of sentiment is still existing in many parts of Europe, many parts of the United States, many parts of, of the world. And, and I'm wondering, have we not learned our lesson? Have we not learned anything? From from what has happened, you know, during the horror horror period um, in Germany and and Italy and elsewhere. That's of course the question. Have we not learned anything? I think we keep unlearning it from generation to generation. That's why I insist on speaking about this history, learning more about this history, getting the facts straight, and then you know, keep on talking about it and introducing it into our educational curricula. Um, but and I very often feel that knowing the historic facts uh, also in the context of, of uh, historical case studies um, uh, is, is, an, is, a, is, a, is, is tool enough to engage persons, but not everybody believes the same. They believe we have to find different ways of educating and engaging the public. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking to colleagues to learn more about how to effectively um, introduce, well, ultimately it starts with knowledge, right? You first have to have the information, then you can get transformed, right? And then you can, you can form then transform. But first you have to have the information, I think, right? Um, and that's lacking in certain, in, in large parts of the population, certainly in this country. Definitely. And, and maybe to kind of relate that conversation to body donation, to see the, the, the practices at those times where like executed people, people who were killed for capital offenses, like made up offenses. And even though it was legal by their standards in courts, what was never, never due process and due justice, that those people were, were uh, that they really needed and that they, uh, the, the old society owed them justice. And I'm wondering about today in terms of uh, body donation specifically, um, are we, 
more ethical or less ethical these days in terms of how bodies are procured for anatomy, anatomy and anatomical studies. Where is the current state of, of that of that uh, particular uh, body donation practices? Uh, and I'm, I, and I'm, I know this is probably broad and it differs from country to country and from university to university. But if you were to like say take a weather like put a weather vane out and say generally this is where we stand in terms of body donations are we more or less ethical more or less paying attention to justice these days well i think in general uh, body donation programs are in terms of body acquisition still the gold standard in terms of acquiring bodies for anatomical dissection can we do better in those programs that are functional absolutely uh, we and that is work that's currently done right we're looking at our consent uh, documents we're looking at what our donors actually agree to how much they actually know about these programs um, but I'm not too worried about that because uh, these people truly come voluntarily to us um, and you can structure that's another thing you can structure a body donation program in a manner that it's, for example, not merely a financial incentive here in the United States. That's always a big deal, right? Because everything is too expensive. But it shouldn't be merely a financial uh, incentive, right? It should be, and, and it usually isn't. It usually is a combination of everything. But we have to run these body donation programs, and I have to uh, uh, um, uh, declare here that I'm not part of any body donation program formally, but we have to run them in a manner that uh, disincentivizes pure financial reasons. On the other hand, we have to make it attractive for everybody, right, so that they can voluntarily decide. Um, and most of the, the, the programs that I know in this country that, you know, people I've spoken to, they're working really well. They provide sufficient numbers of bodies, so there is no problem. But that's in the United States and even better, actually, to a certain extent in, in uh, most of Northern Europe, where, for example, family donations are not allowed. They are frowned upon. Uh, which is not the case in the United States. I don't know what 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 it's like in Canada. Do you guys allow, allow for family donations? Not sure what you mean by family donation there. Actually, when the family says, well, uh, Uncle So-and-so always wanted to donate their body, they just didn't get around to it. Yeah, we. Um, I'm not sure what the current practice is uh, across Canada, and it's uh, often under provincial legislation. And here in British Columbia, the owner of the body is the executor of the, the estate, um, and they can make decisions. And in the past, uh, the UBC body donation program would step away as soon as there was any conflict in the family or in the donation. We would um, immediately step away from it. So I'd say, you know, on the whole, the body donation programs are working well, but we can always do better. And Brandy Schmidt and her group are currently working on a clearer definition of what uh, informed consent actually means in the context of body donation. It will become even more important as people are starting to uh, uh, gain um, secondary data from bodies such as scans and uh, are starting to 3D print parts of the body and plastination. So you'll have to have specific specifications in the, in the donation document where the donor, for example, disallows uh, keeping the body forever through plastination or, or uh, spe specifically allows it. Uh, so these, these things can all be modified. So uh, but we also have to see, you know, that there are so many countries around the world who are not in a position where they can have body donation programs um, just because their population isn't at that, uh, uh, is, is not informed or does, or does not want to be informed or there has been structural trauma uh, and uh, political trauma, colonial trauma that disallows currently for um, body donation programs. And I must say that was most impressive to me in our uh, AFAA that we had on Zoom this year, the meeting in Turkey, 
were our colleagues from uh, from a certain African uh, countries reported on their struggles with uh, a body acquisition. And where our colleague from Ethiopia uh, told us how he maintains anatomical instruction under conditions of war. I was most humbled actually by listening to our colleague. Thank you for this sort of foray into the, the current state of um, of body, body donation programs and how anatomists procure uh, bodies. I mean, it, it has gotten a lot better when we compare it to what you we were referencing earlier. And I think right now, when I kind of look at my colleagues that, that I know, um, I couldn't name a single one who doesn't have a sound ethical compass and knows um, you know, where the boundaries are. And uh, many are advocating with their legislations with their legislators to um, to tighten up legislation around this as well. So I think maybe we have learned from the past, and um, and that is um, that's good. It's human progress, right? So going back to that past, um, a lot of people are reluctant to talk about it. A lot of institutions shy away from this. They want to um, not address it because it's humiliating, it's embarrassing to them. Um, and a lot of the findings from that time continue to live to this day. You referenced the um, the experiments that were done on captive female um, prisoners, uh, resistance fighters, um, and those have re repercussions to current politics. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we, uh, uh, lest we misunderstand, these were not experiments on living human beings, right? That's they, true. I mean, yeah. uh, studies on the tissues of these executed persons. Of course, there were also studies on, on, on living human beings, and some of them were done by anatomists. So uh, we have three anatomists identified who, who, who uh, performed uh, medical experiments on hum uh, living human beings. Um, but that's a different story. So that history certainly uh, uh, continues in, in to a certain extent um, through the, the studies that uh, were published, um, especially on the bodies of the executed. Um, uh, and these studies were read around the world. Uh, we have images from that time that were, uh, some of us are still working with. Um, and uh, coming back to that point, uh, Claudia, that you started with, um, so many of our institutions are grappling with their rather nefarious history currently. I think it, embracing that history in the sense of researching it and making it transparent and known it can only be seen as positive. Because if you don't, it's going to come back and bite you. And we all saw that last year with this awful incident uh, where an anthropology professor went online and gave a lecture on uh, the uh, uh, identification of uh, supposedly anonymous victims and held up the bone of a girl who had been killed in a, an identified girl who uh, had been killed in a police raid in Baltimore in the 1990s. And, you know, uh, this, this incident could have completely avoided if this person had looked at the history of the specimen she held in her hand and, uh, and had made it uh, known to everybody around them. Uh, you have to know your history. You have to make it transparent. You have to share it with the community. And what we currently are learning is you have to decide with the community of what you do with these specimens and with this knowledge that you've gained. Uh, but it all starts by doing the history work, which we're still here in the United States, really just at the start. Um, there's so much work to be done. And I uh, expect in Canada that is very similar. Um, uh, we have to do that historical research, then we have to look at the, the legacies from that research, which is often right there in our anatomical and museum collections. And then we have to identify uh, the persons who have a, a real interest in these collections, who are from the communities uh, from whom these specimens and the knowledge has been, uh, has been originally 
um, provided from or taken away from in most cases. Yeah, it's um, it's a really broad subject. And I mean, it goes beyond anatomy institutions. Okay. Um, so many museums house human remains, uh, human remains that they stole during colonial conquests. Um, they have skulls of identified leaders from the people that they subjugated uh, in their collections. And they're very resistant to uh, to sharing those, uh, or not sharing those, like giving them back to the restitution, to um, righting the wrongs that they have done. Um, what what is it about the collectors of bones, if I can call them that, um, in in these museums and these institutions who have vast collections with hundreds and thousands of bones of identified and unidentified people? Well, it really goes probably. Some people would get, uh, say goes back to the era of enlightenment and the the making of knowledge that we've learned back then, and who who owns the power of knowledge who have, uh, owns the power over the the uh, the instruments of knowledge gain and those can include human bodies they can include bone collections uh, they did include that for many many years uh, anatomical collections in the 19th century were a means to attract medical students, right? Uh, because they could uh, could gain more knowledge with these anatomical collections. And then in the in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, the racial collections of skulls around the world. I mean, it's not uncommon to go to a European uh, Museum of Natural History and find thousands of skulls. Um, and in the in the in the in most cases, these skulls are not identifiable by name. They're very often badly documented. So your example, Claudia, of the identifiable leader of a community is actually a good example because you can actually return them uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, and you will have to, there's no question. Uh, the, the current state of affairs is you will have to return them. Uh, there's no way you can hold on to them. Uh, in the United States, we have probably so far what I've been able to identify the only law that compels holders of such collections to return these uh, um, um, uh, these 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 um, individuals to their communities, and that's the Native American law. Uh, that's by now over 30 years old, but that's the only law that I'm really familiar with. Otherwise, we have only guidelines in many communities around the world have been working on such guidelines. The Maori in New Zealand are really strong in this respect, and they've got their uh, you know, small and homogeneous community mostly in, the United, uh, in New Zealand, very much educated to the fact that you know, what's theirs is theirs, and they have to really return it. Uh, and we have other examples from other parts um, of the world, but we have to do better. Uh, we... Yeah, I agree. We we really do have to do better. I want to go back to a couple of things you said earlier, and that is the power over a body, the power over knowledge, who has the, the authority. And from where I'm standing and looking at it, the authority is still in the hand of white European colonizers who, um, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts with other people as well, that that became the normative view of the body. And it's almost like they they have a curio cabinet of other bones um, that they then choose to actively exclude. Um, so I think these bone collections and all of this history um, is resonating into modern anatomy education to this day. And I think we're just beginning um, to, to rectify that. Um, I think that narrative that started with the enlightenment of categorizing and classifying and owning knowledge and owning bodies, owning knowledge over bodies, um, it's still in our culture, in our culture of anatomists. Very much so. Defining the norm of a body, right? Uh, in in uh, anatomical education, we've had uh, 
a great reason to reflect on that in the last three years. It started for us at Harvard Medical School before the pandemic, when in 2019, uh, uh, students of color came up to us and said, well, we don't see ourselves in your slides or when we talk about the human body. Um, the white male slender uh, European, uh, we don't see ourselves. Why is that the case? And we said, well, and I, what I realized, and that's really interesting, uh, I had realized, you know, years and years ago that there were no, no women in these slides. So that was my topic, right? Old fashioned feminism. I didn't see enough women in these anatomical uh, representations. And my students of color didn't see people of color in different shapes in there. And they also wanted to see fat and slender and very thin and very big people and people who are missing bones and, 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 and pieces of their limbs. So that made us think very hard on what actually the object of our anatomical education is. What can we talk about for certain in anatomy in terms of the structure and the function of the human body? Mostly the structure, of course, for us as anatomists, we're more anatomists and physiologists. And so we formulated the anatomy of the common structure or the common form as a, uh, and that really goes back to a certain extent to ideas that came out of anthropology. For me, it's more and more the most common variation, right? That we talk about, we don't call it normal, but maybe the most common variation with a standard distribution and being aware of that standard distribution from the very start. And that includes things like anatomical sex. So we start our students by, de uh, by defining anatomical sex as uh, what has been traditionally most frequently called anatomical male and anatomical female. We talk about the, uh, the fact that there is an intersection of those, that there is a continuum and not a binary and that how that is different than from gender. So we start talking about this, but we're still forging that language. And yes. we need more colleagues like you to get involved in this. Yes, thank you for that. Um, the, I think I speak for us here that we accept the challenge and, and we will do our best to, to, to do that and you know follow on and to keep looking looking up to you. Uh, no, 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 you guys are, you guys are creating the new visuals. <laughs> we, we need you. <laughs> so thank you, Sabina. Um, just to kind of begin to round up our discussion, I, I want to bring it to kind of a, again, because we started on a personal level, looking at you and your history and your, and how you entered into anatomy. And I wanted to kind of end on that note as well to, to ask, when you look at all that you've done and all that you've accomplished together with others, what gives you hope um, in terms of the work that you do? Oh, our you students, our students, it's always our students. And the fact actually, and I should add that, that people like you uh, create these teams of, of forward looking new anatomical education. Um, uh, we, uh, we have now for the first time an association, a professional association wide discussion on ethics and anatomy, who would have sunk 20 years ago, right? Um, so things in that respect are looking up currently a lot. So it's teamwork. And trust me, I'm not a born team worker. I had to learn that the hard way. And it's always our students. Uh, they give us the ideas. Um, that question from our student, Hannah, who came up to us, where, where am I in these images? That has moved me for the last three years and it's moving me forward. Wow, that is such a very inspiring story. And, and certainly from a personal point of view, I can say that as well, that our students actually give me the, the courage and the hope and the energy to continue uh, to continue working as hard as, as I can um, to just ensure that we are more equitable, we are more, we pay more attention to justice, we, we are more inclusive in all that we do. So thank you so much, Sabina. Uh, Claudia? You. Yeah, I, 
I join Shagan in this huge thank you for uh, for sharing your story and your insights. Uh, what a conversation this has been really going back through European history and really exploring the value of a human body and how um, how we lost sight of that for many years during very dark periods of our history, um, starting in colonialism and then I'd say peaking during Nazi Germany where the value of a human body was, well, next to nothing if you were within a group that was considered not valuable. Um, I think the future is bright. I think when I look at our students, when I look at a, you know new faculty coming into the field, when I look at the changes that have been occurring in professional organizations, not just within the American Association for Anatomy, but also in the German uh, Anatomical Society, the UK Anatomical Society, these conversations are happening. The reckoning with our colonial past, the reckoning with uh, the Nazi past is happening. And I think it is informing uh, a much clearer ethical pathway forward. And Sabina, really a huge thank you to you and your scholarly work who has, has been a significant voice in making this happen. Um, I think without your work and your dedication and your collaborations, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation at this level. So um, thank you for, for everything that you've done. Thank you very much for having me. That concludes another episode of Body Banter. Um, Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>